please take your Bibles and turn with me to the, uh, the book of Ephesians, and we're going to come into Ephesians chapter 4 this morning, continuing off from where we left off last time. The text today is chapter 4, verses 17 down through verse 24. Paul begins this section by saying, Now, this I say and verify, testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. Then he gives this whole description of what the Gentiles look like and how they walk, kind of thing. And then he picks up the theme again in chapter 5, verse 2, where he says, And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. It begins, don't walk the way the Gentiles walk, but walk in love. You must no longer walk as the Gentiles, you must walk in love. Of course, he introduced the whole idea of walking in verse 1 of chapter 4 when he urges us to walk in a manner worthy of the calling of God. And if you recall in verse 2 of chapter 4, he identifies four characteristics that broadly describe this, uh, this walk. This worthy walk. You're to walk in with humility. You're to walk with gentleness, with patience. You're to walk with forbearance, bearing with one another. And what is the last thing? At the end of verse 2. Love. Love. And, and, and love becomes that, that broad description of, of everything put into action. Love. And, and he ends this introductory section in verse 16 by telling us that when the church is functioning properly, uh, then the body, that is the, the body of believers, are built up in what? In love. And so he starts with love, he ends with love, then in 17 he says, don't walk away the Gentiles do, in chapter 5, walk in love. Walk in love. <coughs> So a functioning church is centered on the Word of God with pastors and teachers who disciple the saints. The body of Christ is built up through evangelism, one brick at a time, one soul at a time, and it is matured in love through the teaching and preaching of the Word. And that is a love for one another and love for the lost and love for God. See, if we don't become true worshipers who are more and more in love with God, then the church is not doing its job properly. The disciple body becomes a worshiping, loving body. And a new life that exists within the church that didn't exist before. And it's a new life of love. A new life of love. Now, in the remainder of the book of Ephesians, Paul begins to get very practical in helping us to see what this new life of love looks like. So from chapter 4, verse 17, right down through to verse 21 of chapter 5, he describes this new life of love within the church as a whole. No one is to be excluded, so he's talking to all of us in this particular section. He makes some contrast between the old way of life and this new way of life, which is the new way of love. And then from chapter, or verse 22 of chapter 20, sorry, from verse 22, chapter 5, <coughs> that would be funny if there was 22 chapters in Ephesians. That would be. But from verse 22 down to verse 9 of chapter 6, he starts getting a little more personal and starts honing in on specific areas of the body of Christ within the church as a whole. And, uh, and here he, he gets specifically talking about the family, the family relationships. So he says we need to understand what this new life of love looks like in the family, between husbands and wives, between children and parents, and between slaves and masters. Because we don't have slaves and masters in our homes today, and, and uh, it's 
some people think that we need to apply that to the employers and employees. Well, there possibly is a connection there, but when we get to this section, we'll, we'll see that there is some instruction to slaves and masters. And then in the last section from chapter 6, verse 10 to 620, he shows the way of love for each individual believer in who is where who is to wear the whole armor of God. You see, this new life of love includes struggles within the individual, within the family, and within the church. But this new life of love is victorious over those struggles. See, that's why we have to individually put on the armor of God. And then if we have it individually, then in our, in our families, each member of the family who wears the armor of God wins the struggles and the battles in the home. And when, if in the church, if each member of the church is wearing the armor of God, then we're able to be victorious over the struggles and battles within the church. So it's all about Christian conduct. It's a conduct that is described as love. So this whole section from verses 17, from 417 right through to the end, is part of salvation that we undergo daily. It, it is where the Christian walk and our, and our beliefs meet each day that we live. It's where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. And, and the question that we struggle with, that I'm assuming that we all struggle with it because I struggle with it, and the question is this, how do we grow more holy every day? How do we become more in love with God every day? How do we show love that results in victory over all of the struggles every day? And we, we've learned over the past few weeks when we were looking at the topic of justification um, that not only are we justified now at the moment of our salvation, so positionally we are in a right relationship with God where He declares us righteous because of the righteousness of Christ, but the Bible also tells us that we still continue to sin. And, and that becomes a, a difficult thing for us to try to understand. That how can I, as a righteous person, with the Spirit of God inside and with, with um, Christ's own righteousness, with the new nature, and all of these things, how is it that we continue to sin? And especially when we read verses like Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, in which Jesus says, You therefore must be perfect, as your Heavenly Father is perfect. Uh, that's a hard verse, isn't it? Or take 1 Peter 1, verses 14 to 16. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you was holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. That, that, that's kind of hard, isn't it? And it makes that question about how we grow in holiness a tougher question to answer. So how do you make your life square up to what you believe? Uh, remember when we looked at chapter, on Father's Day of this year, when we looked at chapter 6, verse uh, 4, and talking about fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath. We understood that the provoking is, is actually the result of not walking the way we or walking the way we talk. We, we don't walk according to what we believe. So when we say we believe one thing, but we live differently, and it causes our children to grieve to be provoked. And rightly so. Yeah. And so uh, we, we saw that the, the whole book of Ephesians is divided into two parts. There's the, the doctrinal portion, and then there's the practical portion. There's the orthodoxy and the orthopraxy. There is what we believe and how we are to live. And what we believe comes first and dictates how we are to live. But if we don't live according to what we believe, then we're hypocrites. So this Christian life really is a life of struggle. But there's a positive aspect to it, which we're going to eventually get to this morning. So this is our struggle. And even in, in Romans chapter 7, Paul talks about that struggle as a Christian. And he says, the thing that I want to do, I don't do things that I don't do are the things that, that I end up doing. And there's this battle within me between my flesh and my spirit. So 
the question we are asking is, how does one become a better Christian? How do we start living according to the new nature, according to who we are in Christ? Again, if you remember that uh, when we look at the... Oops. I advanced that too soon. I thought I had another slide, but I didn't have it. So scratch that last sentence, okay? Yeah. <laughs> okay. This is where uh, Paul begins here in the verses that we're going to look at today, beginning at verse 17. How do we start living according to this new nature, according to who we are in Christ? And he starts with a contrast between who we are in Christ and who we were outside of Christ. Uh, biblically, then, before our salvation from birth, we're described in the scriptures as being in Adam. After salvation, we're described as being in Adam. Christ, who is, of course, the second Adam. You can read all about that in Romans chapter 5. Now, in this whole section here, verse 17 to 24, Paul makes a lot of statements to which he assumes that you have some other understanding, that you have some knowledge of some other basic truths to help you understand what he's saying here. Now, and that's what makes this text so difficult to interpret by itself. Um, somebody asked me today how my week went, and uh, I have to say that this week was probably one of the most stressful weeks I've had in trying to put together this message. And, and the stress came, uh, not because I had two messages I was trying to work on, but it, it's because of the difficulty in trying to exegete and understand these verses from 17 down to 24. And, and I end up reading a lot of commentaries, and there's a lot of different opinions as to what Paul is, is saying here. And I had to come to the conclusion, and I think it's the right conclusion this morning, that, that the reason why we have difficulty in understanding what Paul is saying is because we don't have some underlying other teaching and foundation which makes us go, ah, oh, that's what Paul is talking about here this morning. So <clears throat> what I'm going to do today um, is, uh, uh, is we're going to, I'm going to sort of take you through a little bit of a teaching lesson uh, of some things, but I'm going to do it fairly quickly. Uh, in fact, if you look at verse 21 here of the text, there's one phrase there. He says, he says uh, I assume that you heard about him and you were taught in him. And Paul is assuming that there is some things that they have already been taught, and he's building on those things that he's not mentioning here in the book of Ephesians. Now, uh, it's very possible that uh, he's... He, uh, he may be talking about uh, the things that he wrote in the book of Romans or the book of Colossians and perhaps even the, uh, the book of Galatians. Um, the church in Ephesus was founded uh, on his second missionary journey around 52 AD. Galatians was written before that um, and Romans was written shortly after that. So, so the church is in the area of Ephesus and around that surrounding area would have at least had Galatians and Romans by the time Paul has written the book of Ephesians. And although some commentaries say that Ephesians and Colossians were written at the same time, and I suppose there's probably a lot of good evidence for that, it's also assumed that Colossians was distributed before Ephesians. Um, almost as if, as if they he was saying, okay, he wrote these at the same time, but he's telling the churches that you need to read Colossians first before you look at Ephesians. And that's one of the reasons why we read Colossians this morning in our scripture reading, so that we can get a, a, an understanding. You'll, you'll see the, the parallels as we go through these verses. <clears throat> now, we can't know exactly what Paul is referring to here, but there are some things that you need to know um, to make this text clearly understood. So I'm going to give you a brief overview of actually of an in-depth study that I, I teach um, titled The Inner Man. Um, there are a lot of false views out there of what biblical sanctification is and what it looks like. Uh, I don't know if you've been exposed to any of the various higher life movements, um, but I found that these teachings on sanctification leave me frustrated leave me very, not knowing really how to deal with my Christian life, uh, leads, leads me in more failure than in victories. Their emphasis on performance and perfection could not explain why I continue to sin as a Christian. I mean, 
had I not surrendered enough? Sort of the, the parallel of what they're trying to teach. So scripture teaches that we are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Yet knowing and believing that God is always at work in us. We have a scripture verse that tells us that. If you want to flip over to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Let's look at two verses in Philippians. Let's start first with Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. In Philippians 1, verse 6, Paul says, I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you, so who's the he? God. Okay? So God who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So God is going to bring it to completion. So what he started, he will finish. Okay? We do have eternal security here. We will continue to walk with him. Now let's flip over to chapter 2, verse 12, and where he says, um, um, at the, the last beginning, the last phrase of verse 12, he says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Okay, so there is something that we've got to do. We have a responsibility for our, our own spiritual growth. Verse 13, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Okay, so what we see here is that we're to work out our salvation. And uh, the reason he doesn't use the word sanctification there, of course, is because sanctification is a past, present, and a future aspect to it. If we were saved, if we are being saved, and we will be saved at the end of the age. And so he's talking about that aspect of salvation where God is now perfecting us in this life over before the, the end. And uh, so we are to do it in fear and trembling, yet knowing and believing that God is always at work within us. And next week we're going to, to look at the, the question of uh, how does the Holy Spirit then come in in terms of His role and my role in my sanctification? Okay. I mean, why are we not perfect? If we have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, if we have a new nature, if we have um, the righteousness of Christ, if we are justified with all of them, why are we not perfect? So we're going to answer that question next week. Um, so hopefully that will give you enough reason to, to come back next week. So, um, let's continue on here though, and, uh, and, and hopefully I can get through this simple enough. You've got to remember that this is a, a course that, that, that I, I take over several hours to do. So I'm going to try to give it to you as quickly as I can. But the Bible teaches um, that we, outside of Christ, before our salvation, that we were in Adam. And the term that it uses to describe that, that position is the old self. So you can even see it here in verse 22, where we're told to put off the old self. Okay, so there's the old self and there is the new man. But we are in Adam. So let's take a look broadly at what the scriptures teach about the old self south of being in Adam. And uh, the first thing that we need to know is, is that man is made up of two parts. Made up of, an, there's the outer man and there is the inner man. Now to, to uh, let's just look at a scripture here, go flip over to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I'm not going to be able to give you a lot of verses to back up some of the things I'm going to say, but uh, hopefully you can find these uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, or 16. So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away. So this is the outer man. This is the, the, the material part of us. It is the physical part of us. It is the, um, um, the skin, our vision and hearing, our skeletal system, our nervous system, our vascular system, our muscular system, it includes all of our fluids, the blood and the water, it includes our organs, our heart, brain, lungs, etc., our cells, all the electrons, amino acids, protein, DNA, uh, all of these things are this outer portion, the, um, uh, the outer man. And, uh, <clears throat> and it, of course, is wasting away. And then we have the inner man. To continue on in that verse, it says, So though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. So there is an inner part of man, which is the spiritual part of man. Uh, the, the, uh, and it contains a number of 
of hearts. But this is where the scripture gets a little bit confusing because uh, when it's describing the inner man, it uses a number of terms that refer, refer to a spirit. <coughs> Sometimes you'll find scripture that's talking about the spiritual man. It's time of the whole thing. Other verses are talking specifically about the spirit within man. Or about the flesh. Or about uh, the whole inner man, the spiritual man, being the flesh. Uh, sometimes it talks about uh, the mind or the soul or the spirit. It uses all of these words interchangeably. But if you look at all the verses and put them together, you can actually come to a, a, an understanding of the different parts, um, and which will help you to interpret those verses when you see yeah. these specific words. So, so we're going to look at the, the um, inner man here this morning. And the first thing that we realize, that it, we know, is that the scripture teaches us that we have a nature. We have a nature. God has created us with a nature. And uh, the book of Ezekiel tells us um, that that nature is a heart of stone, um, and, and uh, uh, it's it's hard. It is hard to penetrate. Jeremiah seventeen nine: the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Okay, so here we have the nature being called heart, and the heart referring to the nature. Okay, so this this is our nature, and when uh, Adam sinned. Um, this, our nature fell, so that the moment we were born, we were born with this sinful, hard nature. The second thing that, we, that the scriptures tells us that is within the inner man is the flesh. Uh, I just illustrated here as a box, uh, I illustrated as black because the flesh is, is sinful. It is where the desires of sin um, dwell with, within us. Um, it also tells us that the, the flesh is very much alive. So when we're outside of Christ, the flesh is alive. Um, when Colossians talks about tearing down the idols in our lives, he's talking about the idols that are set up in our flesh. And uh, this is what we do. We have idols that we, we, we set up uh, in, our, in our flesh. And we need to break those idols down. Just as the children of Israel, when they came into the promised land under Joshua's leading, one of the things that they had to do is when they were conquering the land, they had to destroy the idols in order to, so that the idols had no influence on them in the land. And spiritually, we are to destroy the idols that, that dwell within our flesh. Um, but we're also uh, en enemies, of course, of, of God. And uh, then the second thing the scripture talks about is it says that we do have a spirit. Uh, a spirit uh, that is opposite to, to the flesh. The problem with the spirit in, in Adam is that it is dead. In Ephesians 2, 1, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. We're, we're spiritual zombies. Um, in our relationship with God, we are <clears throat> we're described as, as, as dead. If you want to look at a, if another verse in reference to this, go to Romans chapter 8, verse 16. Romans 8, verse 16, and just to reference the fact that we do have a specific spirit. Uh, it says the spirit, that is the Holy Spirit, bears witness with our spirit okay, that we are children of God. So there is a spirit within us, but in Adam it is, of course, dead. The next thing that we have within the inner man is the mind. And uh, the mind... <clears throat> Um, the mind contains our emotions. This is where we have our ability to reason. Uh, it's where our conscience dwells. Uh, it is uh, where we have all of our knowledge. That the things that we learn, it's all stored in our mind. It is where we hold our worldview. Uh, that's another topic that we can look at, is what is your worldview? Uh, whether you are a non-believer or a believer, you have a worldview. Thing is, does it line up with what the scriptures teach so that it's a godly worldview? Kind of sounds like an oxymoron, doesn't it? A godly worldview, but it's, uh, it's actually true. Uh, the other thing that we have is the will. Um, we have a will, and the will is the place where we make decisions. Okay? And uh, um, we are decision making people. God made us with freedom, the ability to decide things uh, and to, to make decisions. 
No. But here's the problem. We also have influences that, that are upon us. So even from our outer man, we have um, uh, outside influences, our biological and psychological needs. So that when I am hungry, that affects my inner man. Because now I've got to make a decision. Okay? And, uh, and our heart um, uh, and, and, and the flesh, all of these things put um, desires and passions and they flow down into our mind and through reason and emotions and conscience and knowledge and our worldview, we interpret the data and that flows into our will. And what happens is, is the strongest influences affect the will and the will decides and makes decisions based on those, those strongest influences. And of course the result is that we do need actions that are done. Um, so uh, we, we, it results in expressions. So when you smile, or when you scowl, those are, are decisions and deeds of the will that come from the desires that are filtered through. And, uh, and where your hands go, what you do with your hands, where you, what you do with your feet, where you go, and the things that you say with your mouth, all of these things uh, are, are determined through this process of everything being filtered down through the, the mind and the will. What you notice there is to see because the spirit is dead, it really has no influence. You might conclude by that that well, that must mean that people who are in Adam can't do anything good. No, that's not true. Okay, because um, um, we still can make good decisions. So that even the world, when they see people who are hungry, when they see people who are hungry, they can focus that through and say, "Hey, I'll feed them," and because it will make me feel good always comes back to the self in some way or other. Now, um, let's see what we're going here. Okay, so let's, let's talk about now what the Bible says about in Christ. See, because when we come to Christ, a number of things happen. Uh, when we are born again, when we are regenerated, uh, we, are, we are given a new heart. We are given a new nature. In Ezekiel chapter 36, again, where it described that we have a heart of stone, says, I will put my spirit within you, and I will remove your heart of stone, and I will replace it with a heart of flesh. Now don't get confused there, because uh, what he's talking about is the subtlety of it. So that the heart of stone is hard, you can't penetrate it, it's at enmity with God. But a heart of flesh is, is, uh, is softened to God, and it loves God, and loves the things of God. It uh, desires to worship Him and to please Him. And this is what you and I experience at the moment of our conversion. That changed nature, that brand new nature that, that was put within us, we desire to love God. In fact, I would venture to say, okay, you can agree with me if, uh, or disagree with me if you want, but I think that you'd be wrong if you disagree with me. But the desire of every single Christian in this room is that I never want to sin again. Isn't that right? Amen. Okay. We want to please God. That comes from our nature. We love the things of God. We love His church. We love His word. We love singing songs and singing hymns. We love all those things that are described as part of God. That's because we, our nature is now changed. Our nature is changed. So the next thing that, that is, is that we realize that in Christ, the flesh is still alive. But now the spirit is alive. Ephesians 2, 5. But God, in His great mercy, made us alive. Remember that verse? He made us alive. Our spirit is now alive. Our spirits, our desires, our spiritual desires for, for godly things and for living right and for making right, those desires are, are now reborn within our, within our inner man. The problem is, by the white box, is, is showing that it's actually small. And the thing is that in the Christian, in Christ, our spirit is, um, is getting stronger at the same time the flesh is getting weaker. That's why we have to work at our salvation. We have to work at making our spirit stronger and work at making our flesh weaker by breaking the uh, down the idols within our hearts, by, uh, by, uh, by putting our affections in the right place uh, in all of those different things. Okay? Um, 
we still have influence, we still have the same influences, the same outside influences, the biological, psychological influences. But now, within the inner man, we have the influences of the desire of the spirit, we have the influences of the desire of the flesh, we have the influence of a, of a heart, a nature that loves God and wants God, and those things flow down into our minds, our emotions have, have changed, our, our reasoning has been, become spiritual, our conscience is made more alive because of the presence of the Holy Spirit. We are gaining knowledge about God and about His Word, about what He expects of us. We are developing a proper biblical worldview. And all of these things, as they filter through, uh, we find that, that our lights start exhibiting more godly actions. And the deeds that come through our, our will and the decisions that we make um, start to reflect that... that um, righteousness of Christ. And the scriptures in the book of Galatians it tells us that, that our deeds are either the fruit of the Spirit or the deeds of the flesh, to put them into broad terms. Now let's just look at a, at a, a really interesting verse here in Galatians chapter 5, <clears throat> which puts this into perspective. Galatians chapter 5 verse uh, 16. Galatians 5 verse 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Okay, you see, that's that black arrow that comes out of the flesh, the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things that you want. I, I, I'm of the opinion that in verse 17, the two times that the Spirit is mentioned there, it should be a small s because it's referring to this spirit. What we see here is that, is that the spirit and the flesh within us are in constant conflict. Okay, that there's, a, there's a battle between the desires of our spirit and the desires of the flesh, those things that are there. That's why we've got to work at it. We've got to strengthen the spirit and we've got to weaken the, the flesh. We've got to work at those, those things. Okay, so there's the, the battle that exists there. So, now of course, all of these things build, when we make decisions and we filter things through, it builds habits in our lives, and the habits come back and, and influence again our mind, become part of the, uh, the, uh, the decision process as to what desires our will is actually going to obey. So that's what it is to be in Christ, and uh, um, from the scriptures, now this is the thing then that, that, that um, Paul has, believes that we understand underneath before he comes to the verses. So let's come to, to our text, okay? So uh, there's the, the broad picture of what it is, and we'll see how the text fits into this. So let me get my Ephesians 4 here, 4, 17. Okay, so Ephesians 4, verses 17 to 19. First thing he says there, now, this I say, and I testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. Now, sometimes... The scriptures use the word Gentiles to refer to Gentiles as opposed to Jews. And certainly that's what Paul was doing in chapter 2. Remember that there are Jewish believers and there are Gentile believers. To put it properly, more politically correct, biblically correct, okay, they are all believers. Some have a Jewish background and others have a pagan background. And uh, those with the Jewish background, we say that they are Jews. Those with the pagan background, we call them Gentiles. But the scriptures also uses the term Gentiles to refer to everybody who is outside of Christ. And that's how Paul is using it at this point. So when he says no longer walk as the Gentiles do, he's talking about everyone who's outside of Christ. Everyone who's in, in Adam, that picture that we, we just finished looking at. But look at what he says. He says, in the futility of their minds. Now the word futility means depraved. And depraved means that it is um, um, void of the truth. Void of the truth. So our minds, you see, uh, when we're in Adam, the mind is void of the truth. It doesn't have the truth there. So now you can understand why it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 that we cannot, that the unspiritual cannot discern things of the spirit. That it cannot reason with God. It cannot have a conscience which is alive to what sin really is. This is why people can, can uh, have abortions. This is, this is why people can, uh, can, can live the homosexual lifestyle. Because they have no conscience to the sin 
And those things as being sinned against God is because their minds are depraved. That they are absent of the truth. And uh, then he says that they are um, have a dark understanding. In verse, verse 18, they are darkened in their understanding. And again, darkness speaks to, to the fact of sin. That in within that mind, uh, as, as uh, these desires are filtering through to our depraved minds, um, the, the strongest thing, we have a dark understanding. They don't understand what the truth is. The third thing it says there is that they are alienated from the life of God. So those who are outside of Christ are alienated from, from God. They are not in fellowship with God. And we already know to do that part. That was pretty simple, right? But uh, they're alienated from the life of God. But they're alienated again because of their ignorance. Okay? Um, uh, because of their ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their heart. They have hard hearts. So again, Paul is describing here the nature, that old nature. That it is a hard nature. It's a heart, it's a nature that cannot be penetrated. It hates God. It is at enmity with God. It is at average to God. To, to describe the, the man outside of Christ, the, the unsaved person, what he is doing is he is running as hard and as fast as he can away from God. There is no one who is righteous. There are none that turn to God. They're not standing there at the door of heaven and banging at the door and saying, let me in, let me in. They're all running as fast and as hard as they can away from God. They do not want God in their lives. Okay, that's because of their hard heart. And then uh, the next thing it says, uh, verse 19, they have become callous. Okay, the callous, again, is because of the habits and the decisions that they have made in their lives that it has made them callous to the things of God. Have you ever witnessed to people and you go, they say things and you go, I can't understand why they can't. It just doesn't make sense. Don't they have a brain in their head? They can't. Well, they can't. It's like a callus. And, and a callus is hard. You can't penetrate it. Um, I used to play, I still play guitar, but not near as much, so I have no calluses anymore. So when I begin to play my guitar, my fingers get really painful. Okay? But, oh, but before, when I was a teenager especially, I, I practiced the guitar two hours every single day, and I had calluses on there. You could take a pin and stick it in my finger, and I'd never feel it. See? So how, how do you expect the, 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 those who are in Adam to feel the prayer of, um, uh, um, of conviction? Their lives are callous. They're so callous. Look at the next part of the verse. Um, it says they give themselves up to sensuality. So these again are the decisions that come through the will that they do. Okay? The sensuality, greedy, um, and, uh, and every kind of impurity. This describes the life of of, uh, of those who are in Adam, that, that old self. So we see how Paul has put this in there. And again, he's contrasting this old life so that we can see the new life and understand what it really means to have this new life of, of love. So now, now, the parallel text to this in Ephesians is Ephesians chapter 2. So just flip back to there. Okay, we, we, haven't, we never looked at this before because I knew we were going to look at it at this point. So let's look at Ephesians 2, verse, verses 1 to 3. Okay. Again, verse 1 says that we are dead in our sins. And I've already shown that that's talking about the, the state of our spirit within the inner man, that it is in fact dead. Okay. It does not understand the things of God. It cannot turn to God. Okay. Um, then it says, uh, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the air, a spirit which is now the work of the sons of disobedience, among whom you once lived, in the passions of your, what does it say? The passions of your flesh. Okay? So again, you see, the flesh there is alive. It's got passions. It, it has sinful desires that it wants you to fulfill, that it wants you to do, and it attempts you to do. And then what's the next phrase? Desires of the? Of the body, okay? <clears throat> the desires of, the, of the, the body. There it is there. And those outside influences. And of the mind. And it's the desires of the mind. So you have those desires within the mind. So when you realize that the mind is, is depraved, that does not have any truth. When the, the body itself is depraved, when the flesh is depraved, when the nature is depraved, when all of these things are without truth, and they, and they all have passions, and all have desires, and they're following the course of the evil in this world, then, then you can see how, how, a, how that affects the life outside of Christ.
Christ. And of course, it tells us there that, that we are um, children of wrath. And there's two aspects to that, being children of wrath. And one is that we, are, we come under the wrath of God, so therefore we are children of wrath. But we also are children of wrath because that's the description of our lives. Our life is a life of wrath. It's a, it's a life of sin. And therefore, we are, it's another way of saying children of the devil or following the prince of the power of the air. So that's verse, chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. But we'll come back to chapter 4, get into our text here. To verse 20 and 21. This is where the really difficult part is here, trying to understand what Paul is saying. But in verse 20 he says, But that is not the way you learn Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Christ. So Paul is, is interjecting here. He's, what he's saying is, it, uh, is he's referring back to verses 17 to, to 20. In verse 17 to 19, rather, he said, he said, you need to understand that you cannot learn Christ while you're in that state. It is impossible. That's why Paul in Romans chapter um, 3 says there are none righteous. There are none who come to God. You cannot, the, 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 the lost man cannot in his own turn to God. Um, that's not the way that you learn about Christ. But verse 21 says, but I'm assuming here that you have in fact heard about him. Now this is a reference going back to chapter 1, verse 13, where he said in him also, when you heard the word of truth. Okay, so this is the gospel presentation. He says, this is how you learn about Christ. It is through the gospel, being pretended. Um, so I, I assume that you heard about the gospel of Christ. Okay, and, uh, and that you were taught in him through other, other things, but also in this verse, um, you heard the word of truth, and uh, here it is, Ephesians 1, 15, you heard, and you believed, and you were sealed by the Holy Spirit. Okay, that's, that's a process, and that's how it works, um, that, uh, <coughs> that you come in, into Christ. And then we come to um, Ephesians 4, 22. And this is, this is an interesting verse, and the problem with these verses here is to put off the old self, to be renewed in the spirit, to be put on the new self, are all infinitives. And in, infinitives are difficult to, to, um, um, to interpret, and, and uh, sometimes people just put it in the simplest form um, to do something. Now the first two are, the first and the last one are errors. So they're talking about not so much the past, but a point of action that has happened, something that has happened at a point in time. Generally in the past, the time is determined by the, the context. And then the, the next one, the middle one, is actually in the, the present. So let's take a look at those. Um, verse. Oh. Four go to that. Oh yeah, no, that's the one I want. <laughs> that is the one I want. Because verse 22 says, put off the old self. Okay? Now, the problem here is, is it is not a command. It, it, it reads like a command to us in English. Um, it's not put off the command, but it is in fact that when you heard the gospel, when you believed in the gospel and became your salvation, when you were sealed with the Holy Spirit, what happened is that the old self was in fact put off. So that you are no longer in that, but you are in Christ. It is, in fact, a, something that happened the moment that you, were in, that you were saved. It is not something that you continually do from this verse. Okay? Colossians talks about putting off as a continual thing. That's a different thing. Okay? This here, putting off that old self, is getting rid of the old Adam. But that's done to you. It's, it's even in the... the, the it's something, it could be middle or past. So, so, but it is something that is done through your conversion repentance and trust and faith and through the work of the Holy Spirit <clears throat> baptizing you into Christ so that you are taken out of Adam. So all of those things that are there, they are, are gone and you are now in Christ. Okay? Uh, look at verse 24. Okay, verse 24. To put on the new self. Again, it's not a command to be putting it on. Okay, but it's an infinitive that in fact at that same time where you were no, you were you were taken out of Adam, you're no longer in Adam, you are now in Christ, created after the likeness of God in true, what's the next word? Righteousness. You see that? 
It is a pure justification. The imputation of Christ's righteousness to you and I. It is this picture now. So that our spirit is alive, we have a new nature, we have new desires, our, our, everything about that inner man has been set free from the bondage and slavery to all of the sinful desires that we once had before. It's all there and we are able now to walk with God, to love God, to worship God, to make our lives reflect the righteousness of Christ within us. Alright, so yeah. So 424 is referring to that, um, that new self that we, we have in Christ. We are in Christ. It's our position in Christ. Now let's look at verse 23, because verse 23 actually is the key to everything here. It is the key. And it says that we are to um, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Again, okay, it's not a command. It's not something uh, that you actively do, but it is something that has happened. And it says that at the moment where you are out of Adam, Put into Christ. Those things have happened in the past. At a point of time, at our conversion, he says, but now, he says, you began to be, be renewed at that same time. And now it's a present infinitive. That renewal continues. And what it is saying is that it is, you began a progressive renewal at the moment that you were we're saved. So being renewed in the spirit of your minds. And, and in the spirit and of the minds is a, is a, a difficult uh, thing to understand. So let's take a look at this a little more closely. The renewing here that he's talking about, um, it is made up, it's a compound word made up of two words, the word up and the word new. And uh, it, it's, uh, it, it implies that we are, it's a, a process of uh, going up to a newer level. And then from there going up to a newer level. So we're completing a process. We're moving up to a new level of a sanctification. So, so we're, we're, we come into the spiritual life this way. We're going along and we, we grow some more. So we're going up and we go along in, in the process. We're growing we go up, and we're getting closer and closer to Christ likeness in, our, in the expression of our lives, in the decisions, and in the actions that we perform. This is the picture of this renewal. Uh, in fact, this is the only verse where this word is used in all of the New Testament. There are other words for renewal, um, but this is the only time that this one is used. And uh, it's talking about that. So the, it's then what it is doing is it's defining for us what sanctification is. Sanctification is progressive growth in Christ like this until the end. And that began the moment that you were saved. You're no longer in Adam, but you're now in Christ. Your old self has been put off, the new self has been put on, and you began a process of renewing that is going to continue until the end. And it is going to continue going higher and higher and higher in terms of becoming more and more like Christ. So that's how we define it. So, so this is how we can get a picture then of what sanctification really looks like in terms of what this, how the scriptures um, pictures it. So we have the unbeliever there at the bottom, okay, and, uh, and we have the line for justification, which is our salvation, and the line at the top is the line that we cross over at the end. So it's either death, um, and where we actually enter into what is known as entire sanctification. We cannot be entirely sanctified in this life. And uh, there's lots of people that teach that we can, we cannot. I'm not taking the time to, to explain that to you this morning. But here's what happens. <coughs> what we find is that we have the, the old man, again, or not the old man, but we have the flesh and we have the spirit. And there's this constant struggle between the flesh and the spirit. We've already seen how that works. And this is what happens during, between these two uh, dotted yellow lines. And what happens is we have this, uh, it is described in, and shown as a continual dedication that gets stronger and stronger. It's not being more committed. It's not constantly um, having these crisis experiences. It, it, it is times of dedication. Where, where, where the, the dedication gets stronger and stronger and moving higher to higher and higher levels. And of course it's all based on Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 to 13, which we've looked at before. So, coming back to verse 23 again, so that's the renewing. The renewing is the result of having the old self put off and the new self put on. Okay? Well, then what does it talk about when it says 
there in the spirit of your minds. And what is he referring to when he talks about this? And this is really difficult. And I, I read the commentators, um, and there's all kinds of opinion about this here. And, and I put it the best that I could do into the context of, of, of how I understand what Paul is talking about. What he talks about, he's talking here about the spiritual aspect of your mind. And he's really referring to, again, that regeneration. But it's that regeneration, not just of the mind, but that regeneration of the whole inner man. He's referring to the fact that we've got a new nature. He's referring to the fact that we have a spirit that is now made alive, alive with, with desires to, to love God and to, um, to live holy lives for Him. And, and, a, and a new mind whereby we're no longer slaves to the reasoning of our flesh and to the desires of the flesh. We can actually, um, um, uh, our conscience is alive and our reasoning and, and our knowledge and, we're, and all of these different things. This is what he's talking about uh, here. So when, when he talks about um, the, in the spirit of your minds, he's referring to all of those parts within uh, that inner man. Everything has been renewed and everything works. But he's emphasizing here again that the way, the, what this new life of love looks like is that it is a life of progressive, increased dedication. That's our part. That is our part. This is what you used to be. And you couldn't do any of it before. But now in Christ you can do it because of this whole change of being out of Adam and, and in Christ. But now you have a job to do. And it's to, to, within that renewing process that is happening, where it's leading into higher things, is that you need to become more and more dedicated. And it happens within the spirit, but happens greater in the mind. It happens in the intellect. How do we get more intellect? How do we get more knowledge in terms of God? What do we have to do? We have to study His Word. We have to study. And this is what he was talking about, Paul was talking about, in, in the first 16 verses in chapter 4. Remember he said, he says, I've given you a bunch of gifts here. And the gifts that I give you are gifted people, pastors and teachers who teach the Word. And it is by teaching you the Word that you are able to do the ministry that God has called you to do. That the church is built up through evangelism and the big church is built in maturity through discipleship. So discipleship and sanctification are, in fact, the same things. And then we have this active part where we have to work at it. We have to expose ourselves to God's Word. We have to study God's Word. We have to grow in the knowledge of God. And there's a lot of verses that I can take you to to, um, to show that aspect of God. And I'm not going to do that um, because of time now this morning. If we were to define it, discipleship, and if we're saying that the major role and duty of the church is to disciple its people, then we could define it this way. Discipleship is progressive growth in Christ's likeness through the preaching and teaching of God's word whereby believers' dedication and worship of God gets stronger and stronger and the desires of the flesh get weaker and weaker. And that's the goal. And that's what I have in my mind for every message that I prepare. Okay. I'm not trying to put together messages that uh, will hit the ball out of the ballpark. I don't want you going away here and saying, wow, that was a this message. Okay, you see, because preaching is progressive and, commute and cumulative. Okay. It's progressive and cumulative. That's why we've been spending several months in Ephesians. And what you will discover is when we finish Ephesians, you're going to look back and go, wow, something's happened. Something has changed. And you may not be able to pinpoint it to one single thing, but it is through that preaching of the Bible, faithfully teaching what God is saying, that God uses it to transform your mind. Okay? Romans 12, 2, you're in, trans, by the renewal of your mind, trans, transform the renewal of your mind, right? Okay? And, and those kinds of things. And, uh, and that's how you begin to, to grow. Well, what, what can we say in conclusion here? In conclusion. David Platt uh, said this. Well, the first thing is that discipleship is the work of the church. David Platt, to quote him, he said, Being a member of the church means realizing that we are responsible for helping the brothers and sisters around us to grow as disciples of Jesus. 
In the same way, they are responsible for helping us. We desperately need each other in the daily fight to follow Christ in a world that is full of sin. We, we live in a, in a world today where Christians take the church for granted. They don't understand how important it is in their lives. And this is what I tried to help you understand when we look at that. You must put the priority of attending church as a priority in your life. Because this is the, the means of grace that God uses to help you to grow. And it's being together. And it's not just this context. And I'm hoping um, and uh, the, the leaders, we need to get together again to start making some decisions on this. But I'm hoping that in January, we're going to start some in-depth Bible studies in addition to our morning worship time. For the express purpose of helping you to grow in your spiritual maturity and to make the uh, flesh weaker and weaker. So the second thing is, um, is that church is where you need to be. I guess it's really a, the same thing that I've already said. But it, it's the church is where you need to be. Thirdly, um, greater, we need greater dedication and commitment. And you know what? You, you don't need emotional things to make commitment to God. Yeah, there's a lot of preachers out there that think that if they tell the story that pulls at your heartstrings, that then they'll get you to make decisions, make you more committed. Uh, now, commitment comes out of knowledge. And, and today, what we've learned from God's word here is that, is that God wants us to be committed people. That He wants us to be um, um, <clears throat> dedicated, more dedicated. So it even begins right now. Right now, before you leave the service today, I'm just saying to God, God, I see and understand that you need my commitment, that you need my dedication, and I am going to be more dedicated to you. You've got to do that, friends. Okay? We have to do this. And fourthly, that you must be in Christ in order to grow. I mean, again, look, just look at the pictures there. There can be people in churches that are in Adam. Okay? Um, Dead spiritually people can look like spiritual people. They're, they're described as wolves and sheep clothing, clothing, right? You know that expression. The thing is, you will never grow. You'll never grow. You'll never truly understand it. You've got to be in Christ. It is when you hear the gospel. And that's why I preach the gospel at the end of, pretty much at the end of every message. Jesus Christ died for you. You're in a bondage situation in Adam. And unless your sins are forgiven, unless you are, are uh, redeemed, unless you are justified, you cannot have a right relationship with God. You must be saved. You must be in Christ in order to grow. Well, <clears throat> I think that's where I'll end it this morning. Well, let me just say one thing reference the next time we get together. We're going to look at verses 24 down to 21 of chapter 5. And one of the things that we're going to see there is that there are actually only three principles. Uh, even in the midst of it, it's talking about putting off uh, things like put away falsehood, speak true. So there's, there's this contrast of, of, of things. That we're not going to look at each of those contrasts. But within those verses from 425 to 521, there are three principles. There's one negative principle and there's two positive ones. So I'm going to give you some homework this week. I want you to read that section and see if you can identify them before we come together next week. What is the one negative principle? What are the two positive principles? I know Ephesians about the mystery of Christ and His church. And it really is a mystery, but it is not totally unknown to us. It is something that we can experience. But we can learn and be that people of God who walk in, in this, the new way, the new life, the new life of God. Father, thank you so much for your word today. Help us to be doers and not listeners only. And help us even now, Lord, to be convicted of the fact that we need to be more dedicated. I pray, oh God, that you'll cause all of us to be more dedicated to coming to church and our church attendance, to being dedicated to meeting the needs of this church through this finances, to be more dedicated, Lord, in learning, in learning, and to be growing then in worship, as we learn to become a worshiping people. Bless this church, Lord, and close with this day. Thank you, God.
we pray. Let's stay together this morning.